Good morning, everyone. Um, really nice to see quite a good turnout uh, locally as well, um, despite uh, the heavy Vapu celebration week going on Monday morning. Nice to have you all here. Um, as uh, Anna Kaiser said, um, AI and in particular creative AI is uh, one of the major trends in game industry right now. And that's what I'm going to focus on here now. I'm going to give you a deep dive on uh, creative AI, especially text image generation. Um, my uh, name is Christian Guckelsberger. I'm presenting joint work here with uh, my um, master student, Vera Wimpari, who did this project as, as, a, as a master thesis here at Auto. Um, Anna Kaiser Kultima, who we just saw, and uh, Perto Hemmerleinen, our professor of games here at Auto. And, and I myself, um, professor in creative technologies here in the computer science department, so this is very much in my domain of interest. So we've been looking at the use of text to image generation in the Finnish game industry. And I guess most of you would agree by now that creative AI um, started well, rivaling the work of creative professionals. It's a really big thing here. It's probably the most disruptive technology that we see right now. And we're kind of st really struggling to get a handle on it. Um, we do have all these discussions going on about the future of creative work, about the lose of like losing of jobs, about copyright and all that stuff. Um, but, but by now we also have, um, well, reality happens. Um, we do see these things, these posts now um, going up on on, um, on Reddit, for instance, where people actually lost their jobs or feel like they're losing their jobs to creative AI. And it really prompts us to understand better what is really going on. Now, as researchers, our take on this is, well, we do believe that there is a real opportunity for creative AI to be used in a sustainable fashion. And by that, I mean that it can facilitate co-creation with professionals in a way that actually contributes to artistic freedom and expression, self-realization and well-being. However, we believe that in order to support this development, um, we really need rich and reliable and transparent insights into what's actually going on, how people actually use this technology, how they perceive it, how they see its future development. Um, and we need to take this information to industry stakeholders, um, to policymakers, to educators and researchers as well. The critical thing is that right now, vital information, um, this vital information is largely missing. Or, to be more precise, the rich, reliable and transparent insights are missing. More specifically, we have seen a lot of coverage on text to image generation like DALI, DALI 2 or um, Midjourney uh, on the popular press. Um, but the problem here is that the treatment is typically quite shallow um, and narrow in the sense of only like one aspect of its use or its perception is being covered. It's often like one side that we only see like one type of audience um, speaking and it's usually biased towards some kind of agenda of the publisher that's often not entirely clear. So if we read an article about creative AI and how fantastic it's actually being used right now by different um, creative professionals on the OpenAI blog, of course we have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, vice versa, other articles can be one-sided too, um, talking about a loss of jobs only and not, not about the opportunities, for instance. So. What I'm trying to say is that um, the public press gives us relatively, relatively little reliability um, uh, in information to be used for policy making. Um, and at the same time, academic work um, has been moving really, really slowly, academic research in this phenomenon. And that's because of the publishing cycles, of course. Um, and, and also we, we set out with this project like almost a year ago, and now I'm here presenting it. Um, so these things take time. But what we do get is a lot more reliable and deeper insights. Um, at this point, um, I can only um, recount two studies on text to image generation by professionals in the academic research. Um, but um, the problem with these studies is, while especially like the lower one here, 
um, is an excellent read and covers a lot of different um, um, creative professionals across uh, a lot of different professions. Um, the problem is that um, they don't focus on one particular industry. And that gives us very little, relatively little depth um, and insights into how this industry is going to be transformed. Um, moreover, existing academic studies sometimes look at a mix between professional users and general public users, which also it makes it difficult for us to understand the implications for professional population. And um, most notably, I believe, um, existing academic studies focus on the use of these technologies. So the actual professional is, I think, reduced to their role as a user, but there isn't so much focus on how do you actually perceive this, how do you actually feel about these technologies, how do they actually think about the impact of these technologies on their future. So to summarize, I believe the research gap here is a lack of exploratory studies, so really looking at the breadth of the phenomena um, of professionals in a specific industry. And that's the kind of gap that we tried um, to fill with, with this study and that I'm going to tell you more about now. So to fill this gap, we conducted an exploratory interview study with professionals from the Finnish game industry specifically. Um, and there was a number of reasons for that. One reason, of course, is that a lot of my research, as well as research work of my um, collaborators here, is on games. So this is quite a natural uh, move for us. But um, we also believe that the game industry is, um, there's so many more reasons why to look at game industry specifically. To begin with, um, the strong use of prototyping and ideation in game, as well as the product-oriented practice, makes Games industry are arguably, so I believe, one of the most vulnerable industries when it comes to the impact of this technology. So we believe it could be something like a canary in the coal mine, like an early warning system for those who are not familiar with the term. Um, at the same time, um, or the, the, the other reason for that is that the game industry is quite well known for as early adopters of AI. So could our insights on game industry actually inform the adoption of this AI in other industries too, in other creative professionals. And finally, um, games just represent a really fascinating industry to study this technology for its range of different um, creative tasks all leading to one final product. So specifically, we've been asking three overarching research questions. So the study is exploratory, but we wanted to make sure we got this stuff covered. We've been asking, firstly, what are professionals' perceptions um, and attitudes toward text to image generation systems? That is what this acronym is here for, um, TTIG, uh, to the, towards these systems and their future. Um, secondly, we've been looking into how professionals uh, adopted and used these systems in their creative practice right now. And thirdly, how they feel, how they see the change in use um, and the future of, of, of these technologies in their creative practice. And uh, we recruited our participants from social media and personal networks. We did both to get somewhat of a representative sample in the end. On the right hand side, you can see our recruitment call. We used the Facebook uh, groups, Finconauts, and Play Finland for that. And we really crafted this, we, we had to pay a lot of attention to crafting this um, invitation um, in a way that it invites people from different backgrounds, with different roles in the game industry, different levels of experience, and also different attitudes towards the use of AI. So we really wanted to make sure we don't write an invitation that sounds like, hey, we think AI is the next great thing for game industry. Can you just give us some opinions that confirm our view, right? So we really wanted to get a diverse set of opinions here, and we tried to, um, to do that by formulating um, with neutral language and also really advocating different perspectives. We also offered people to get an introduction to this technology if they haven't used it yet and all that stuff. So really trying to be inclusive. In the end, we did got a sample of uh, 14 participants, which for a qualitative study is pretty standard. So you might think that's quite little, but for, for this type of study, uh, study, it's quite normal. With a representative um, gender ratio, well, unfortunately, representative gender ratio for the Finnish game industry, but yet representative. Um, 
a good coverage of experience. So people who only got started in Finnish game industry, 1.5 years of experience up to 24 years with a median of about 12 years. Lots of different roles. Um, so well, roughly seven different roles, inclusive, including um, three people in lead roles. Um, from concept artists over UX and narrative designers all the way to creative directors. And um, yeah, working in uh, big, medium, small studios on different types of game genres. So it's quite, quite a diverse sample here. And with all these people, um, Vera did um, about one hour long interviews in a semi-structured fashion. So we had a couple of questions. Um, following the pattern outlined here. So there was like a warm up and a main part and a wrap up. And the warm up was really inquiring about, well, where, where did people come from? What is their experience in game industry? What is their background? Inquiring about these multiple hats that people are wearing. And uh, the main part was then really digging down on those people's perceptions and current use and future outlook of these technologies. And then there was a wrap up where participants also got a chance to well, just name anything that they feel didn't get enough attention in the view. Again, encouraging exploration. And um, in order to, well, we're not the first people to look into how new technologies are adopted, right? So in order to um, pick up some of the um, most important questions here, we also made sure to, um, to inform this questionnaire by the UTOUT, so this user acceptance of information technology model, which is quite big in our field. And um, then we transcribed all this. I'm gonna, not going to bore you with all the details of the analysis, but we basically did a template analysis, which means um, it's a state-of-the-art qualitative analysis method in which you assign codes to parts of the interviews, like even parts of sentences, multiple sentences. It can be quite uh, fine-grained. Um, then you cluster these codes into um, a hierarchy of themes, and you iterate this kind of code book, what comes together multiple times until it kind of converges. Uh, and for us, we did this together to avoid experimental bias or to take out some of that bias. Um, it took about 40 hours of individual work. So it's quite an intense process. And in this analysis, we actually did use themes that we identified from existing work on the popular press. So we directly hook into the discussion as we already have it and see if we can use this also as additional starting points for our analysis. Okay, so let's jump to the findings. In total, we found 12 big overarching themes, 39 sub-themes and many, many sub-sub-themes. And what you can see on the right-hand side is basically this. Um, well, unfortunately, the resolution isn't great here but um, you can see all these different clusters. Each color represents one theme with these small sub-themes underneath. For example, there would be um, a theme on, on creative roles or on roles in the creative process here in, in green in the middle, talking about different examples of the creative process, what it's like to um, working with inputs, outputs, what is the interaction with the systems like, how do people customize the interaction with these systems. Um, there is a theme here in red on people's thought on the impact. So it's about impact magnitude, impact at society at large, um, impact on jobs, on education, on creativity and art, on game production. Um, so these are all the sub-themes. And um, just as a comparison to um, support how big this study actually is, in existing work or in the most comprehensive study that we have so far, people identified eight themes in total, um, no sub-themes. So this is quite a bit more comprehensive. And because it is so comprehensive, in this talk I can only give you a really quick idea of, or like a quick overview of what we found, really just a spotlight on a few things that I find the most intriguing. And that's what I'm gonna do next. So what we're gonna do now is look at our findings based on our three research questions. And the first one was, what are professionals' perceptions and attitudes towards text to image generation systems and their future. And um, what we have here on the right hand side are some quotes underlying our findings. On the left hand side, just some of the, the major findings, but by far not exhaustive. And wherever there is like an arrow here, it indicates that this statement is backed up by a quote on the right hand side. And what we, what we found is this huge mix. Um, so while our majority of participants was um, 
seemed really, really impressed, fascinated, interested in this technology, and some really showing excitement. Um, many also expressed concerns. Um, many seemed quite pragmatic about the whole affair. Uh, and many people were really contradicting themselves. So it's not like one per person was excited, the other person was concerned, but like, you know, um, people are complex animals, so uh, everything happening within individuals. And um, one thing we found is, and that's not really surprising, I suppose, that people are really overwhelmed um, by the pace of development. Um, just as a quote here, people saying, um, you know, I feel like stuff that was impressive even a month ago feels like really crappy by today's standard. And it's that the speed is so rapid, it's so fast. And that's a senior art director saying that. Um, moreover, professionals expressed that they, or we did see this few, well, people seemed very pragmatic about the whole thing. And that's not surprising at all, because as Anna guys already mentioned, game industry has been adopting um, AI for a long time now. Um, which also makes it so exciting for us as AI, en AI engineers to study game industry. Um, and unsurprisingly, a lot of our participants just embrace these systems as yet another tool in their creative toolbox. Um, and that that's comes through these two quotes here. You know, it's like the technology comes, you know it, you just have to adapt. I mean, I've been in the industry so long ago, so I've seen other roles disappear as well. It's sort of a fact of life. So we did see this pragmatism a lot. Um, what really intrigued me was that quite a few people put the final product, the game, over their own um, feeling of change and professional future. So you know, as long as we get a good game of it, we go along with it. Um, I think that's quite telling for the industry and how invested people are. And here's another quote, um, which is a bit more on the hopeful side. It's inevitable that it will be here super soon. You should not be afraid of them, but you should rather adapt to them and see them as tools, not as your enemy. And I have to say, I got quite surprised about this because, of course, even as experimenters, we always go into this kind of research with some kind of expectation. And I thought it would be, well, maybe a bit less pragmatic, right? Um, but let's say we are. Um, moreover, a few more points on the first questions. We have seen, so now on the other side, um, a lot of concern over the fair and ethical use of um, artists' work in um, the training of these systems and how they're being used, like specifying a style um, through, through which to uh, produce an image. Um, and that very much shaped um, the willingness of people to adopt this technology. People uh, were very concerned of the future of their jobs, of their livelihood, but especially the meaningfulness of, of their work. Um, and people perceived different changes in roles when, if they consider their role in the creative process while interacting with the system, how does their own role change when incorporating the system? And some considered them switch, like shifting to the role of a art director of the AI, like the artist becomes the art director, uh, but some also consider themselves becoming a slave to the AI. And what really um, struck me here is that um, the views differ between individuals, but they also differ between um, lead roles and the people doing the first-hand work. And I think that's um, quite nicely reflected in those quotes here, where we have like a creative lead um, or UI UX lead saying that, uh, well, their team is, this using, is, is using this now. We definitely can use just straight out um, from mid-journey, mid like we can use stuff straight out of mid-journey is what it's supposed to mean, uh, and give them to an artist instead. The artist then paints over it, finalizes the product, and they will be super happy now. So that person has been talking about her team multiple times, stressing how happy they are with this new, new technology now. Um, but then we have this other designer saying, well, the further one gets to the heart of the concept, the more heartbreaking it is to hand it over to an AI. So to be just, you know, the publisher, somebody who sort of fixes the errors is not a very appealing idea. And that contrasts quite sharply with the, with the joy that the, the lead here expects. Um, also someone else stating here, again, um, stressing a loss of meaning in their work, 
Um, to me, like when I make my own art, it builds character to go through that journey and that process. And it is definitely something that you connect with on a deeper level. I think it's really rewarding, but sitting and writing prompts is not a rewarding thing to do. So we also have different views on what is the thing that's really meaningful and rewarding about the creative process. Is it like the idea? Is it the process of bringing it together? Is it the final product? When it comes to the second question, um, so we've been wondering about how are these systems adopted and used in the creative practice right now. Um, and when we did the interviews, which, is a, which was in December last year, um, we were surprised to find that people have already been using the systems to very various extent, extents. So just to provide some context, back then the legislation was even less clear than now. Um, and some people well, were only entertaining the idea or evaluating the potential of using this technology, but they were quite far into developing a game already and didn't feel like we can integrate it into the pipeline anymore. Um, some use it only in early stages of the development, I'll come back to that in a moment, but some also use it all the way into the final product. Um, but I think the majority of people um, have only used it in the early stages of production, and that's because of the functional shortcomings of the systems, for instance, being you know really bad at creating hands and faces, um, but also ethical and copyright issues. Um, so ethical issues coming back to um, using the data of fellow artists without remunerating them, um, copyright issues in that, especially if you want to work with brands, you don't know if you can actually get copyright on these products to use in your, in your game. And um, when I talk about early production, I think the most um, frequent uses were really about inspiration um, and to find references, like visual references to back up your ideas early in the day design process, um, to conceptualize and prototype ideas, and to support communication. So a lot of leads told us this now comes in really handy if I want to get across an idea to our customer or um, to my creative team. I just use this to prototype some ideas and you know, uh, a picture tells more than a thousand words. Um, crucially though, while these systems seem to support communication in that way, they also remove opportunities or the need for communication in that the systems where or several participants describe to use the systems to substitute interaction with artists. So rather than interact with an artist, rather than asking an artist to do this for me, I just do it myself. So no communication there whatsoever. And that was, well, not only because artists were sometimes um, very busy or unavailable entirely in small companies specifically, but um, also because it's just quicker. Let's have a look at the third theme. Um, so how, is, um, how are these systems going to change um, and how are they going to be used in future creative practice? Now everyone seems to agree that um, these systems will ultimately increase the efficiency and um, cut production costs in games production. Um, and people also agree that this might have an impact or this will likely have an impact on hiring and outsourcing. However, the extent of that is not quite clear yet and that's really because of leads having to make individual decisions here and I think two really inspiring quotes are the ones on top here. Um, one art director saying, well, instead of hiring five concert artists now, there's need for only three or two. So it might have that kind of effects on the industry. They do see a real impact on hiring decisions here. We need less artists. While another creative director says, First of all, living artists need definitely support to live as a human being, so I would always pay human over any machine. Now that was, of course, the idea in December last year. And now we have to see how um, the, the market forces are gonna impact that. Um, the jury is also still out on how this is actually gonna affect game production, and we had a lot of different ideas on uh, where this could go. Is it just gonna be lead to more and cheaper games of the same kind? Is it gonna enable entirely new games with more complex or different content? Um, or, or is it gonna be both? And people really stressed, uh, stressed both aspects. Um, in the long run, 
unsurprisingly, given all these uh, question marks here, it's still uh, very much open whether um, text image generation will take away or create jobs in the games industry. Um, but there is an absolute consensus, a hard consensus, that roles will change. And uh, that also um, gave us the title for this, for this work. So one art director said, I don't see any way of stopping this wave. So it's like an adapt or die type of situation. Now, of course, that's maybe a bit too traumatic and maybe a bit of a, of a game industry metaphor here. But um, I think it, it catches the sentiment quite well. Um, and um, finally, I just want to note, quite importantly for us here at Alto as game educators, and I'm also teaching in our game design and development masters, um, people raised that game industry and game, uh, that, sorry, that game education must adapt to these developments too. So one participant here is saying, well, unless all of the educational institutions adapt, they will basically educating people who are not going to be able to find jobs. And we do take that very seriously, but we also depend on game industry's feedback on what is needed. So I, I encourage you to, to get in touch on that. All right, wrapping up. Um, with this work, I believe we provide the most comprehensive study of professionals' perception, adoption, and use of these technologies to date, not in game specifically, but even more generally. We've seen people expressing excitement, concerns, inner conflict, ethical reflections, and lots of lots of insights into the use of um, these systems of text image generation in their creative practice. Um, and now we really hope that we can use these results to feed them back to our participants, feed them back into game industry to inspire reflection and, and, and a change in industry to make people feel heard, feel listened. Uh, moreover, we will put this forward to policymakers and researchers to, to just support the sustainable adoption. Now we hope to have a bit more richer and well-informed and reliable information that people can work with. But of course, we only scratch the surface here. Um, technology is changing rapidly. A lot of the stuff that people talked about um, is already solved. A lot of the shortcomings, functional shortcomings, are already um, solved. And um, therefore, we need to repeat these studies and we have to check how the situation is again in half year's time, in a year's time, and so on and so forth. Moreover, what we really need to do is include students um, in these interviews, people who have not, um, who are still training, who have not made um, their entry into the game industry yet, but still want to do. And we are interested in focusing on the dynamics between artists doing the first hand work and, and their leads. Okay. Um, this is it. Um, I can only encourage you to check out our paper. Um, as I said, you know, I really only scratch the surface here. There is so much more in there, and I can promise you there's some really exciting stuff there. We have something like a four or five page executive summary in the paper that you can just read through, and then there is also like a 30 page full report of all our findings. Um, our paper has just been accepted at KaiPlay, one of the major conferences of our field, amongst the top 15% of submissions. So I think there is a really strong interest here and the work is appreciated, which makes me very happy. Um, and finally, to commemorate International Creativity Innovation Day last Friday, I'll to publish this article where there's a bit more of my thoughts on AI and creativity. And now Anna Kaiser is here <laughs> trying to push me off the stage. So I thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Wonderful talk. Um, any question from the audience? If you have any questions, there's a mic uh, coming uh, behind you, so just raise your hand. I'm going to start with there's not too much time mm. for a lot of questions, but I, I really want to ask this. So from your perspective of understanding all the creative AI technologies, what are we going to see for the rest of the 2023? What's, what's in the development? right now that might also be the wow for the practitioners? That's a really hard one. Let, let, let <laughs> me get my, my glass bowl, <laughs> have a good look at it. Um, I'm really curious about the how the pace of development in this year is going to be because now I think a lot of people realize that policy making is not a being not able to catch up with, with the developments. And I think I just read yesterday that people are thinking about putting a stop on big model yeah. training, 
like a kind of six month stop period or so. Mm. And and honestly, I think it might not be the worst idea ever. Mm. Um, what I expect right now is models to keep growing further. I expect um, a lot of these um, functional uh, problems like um, being bad at reproducing certain styles, being bad at reproducing human faces and hands and stuff to be solved. Yeah. So I don't think, I don't quite believe that um, it's going to stagnate here in terms of quality. Yeah. So I think what we really have to focus on is how can people adapt it in a sustainable way so they still find meaning in their jobs. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Any questions? Yeah, there's one. Wait for the mic. Uh, maybe I have a quick little question for you uh, to get your insights on this. So I really think when we have a lot of these like AI created things versus human created things, I think like I find it a good thing in terms of uh, it gives more value to the human created things in a sense that it sort of gives more value to the to the creativity of humans. Like in a sense that everything could be made, but the human made ones have a certain specific flavor that we are trying to, you know, explore right now. What do you think on that? Do you have any thoughts? Um, it's a really interesting one. I wonder if it's a bit of a niche opinion. <laughs> um, I think it really depends. I, w I would say it depends a bit on your background. Um, I'm personally, half of me is like an art historian. I very m much engage and I'm very interested in human creative work and I do see the human element in it. But we have to see how people's, who are not so strongly involved with creative work, how people's perception of creativity and the quality of that work shape, uh, changes and shifts. Um, one thing we heard from our, or one suggestion we heard from our participants too was um, that now there's an opportunity for a human artists to occupy a niche where they focus on well, I guess you could call it um, like really like fully man-made um, artisanal mm -hmm. uh, artifacts yeah. um, and to occupy that niche. Um, I'm, I'm not fully convinced yet. And as I, as I stressed, I think we need longitudinal studies to see how people's perception of creativity and creative work is going to change with those systems being introduced. And um, to that end, we also must be able to distinguish, well, what is actually man-made and what is... Mm. Uh, machine made to keep training our eyes. And definitely the trend that I also see in the survey is that there is different adaptations to workflow so it's going to be completely mixed with the human process and it, like we're going to see games that are completely made by AI. Um, I mean that's also made by a human but but yeah but then it's going to be hard to tell what part is what. Yeah. We already use tools to make things so and I'm, I'm particularly excited about um, what are the, the gamers' demands going to be now that game industry <laughs> is going to ship um, products with a lot of AI influence. Mm. Um, are we going to see more demand um, for uh, the use of AI or more demand for uh, the use of traditional human craft? Um, are people going to be able to distinguish this? Yeah. And I think ultimately these are the forces that will um, decide on um, how um, AI is being adopted in game industry. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to see uh, already in a very short time what's going to come out of the pipelines that are running right now. Thank you, Christian, for this. Thank you. And uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for the questions.